Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Realignment's daily coverage of the Ukraine crisis and Russia's invasion. Today we're joined by Stanford professor Ian Morris. We talk about Russia's grand strategy, how Putin and Russia as a country broadly has approached the post-Soviet period with its specific interest in mind, and how this strategy can and cannot shape what comes next in this crisis. Great episode. Hope you enjoy it. Professor Ian Morris, welcome to The Realignment. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm excited to speak with you. We're going to do the newsy topic, which is this conversation around Russia's grand strategy. But you've also done a lot of really interesting writing that I think serves as a useful background for the audience. So we'll get into that in the second and third parts of the show. But let's just start here. You recently wrote a, a piece uh, a week or so back focusing on Russia's grand strategy. I'd like to see, it's the 15th of March, 5.04 p.m. on the East Coast time. What is just your current assessment of the situation since you last wrote on the topic? Well, I mean, like a lot of people, I have just been totally surprised by how successful the Ukrainians have been in, in, in holding the Russians in check. I, I you know, like a lot of people, again, I seriously thought this was going to be days, not weeks, before everybody kind of threw down their weapons and ran away. So th this has been, I think, the, the big surprise for a lot of us. And to follow up on this, you're writing about geographies and nation states. I spoke about this with uh, former Lieutenant Colonel what do you think determines whether or not a society effectively stands together in the face of this sort of invasion? This is a question that we didn't see answered positively in the case of Afghanistan. This has been complicated throughout the past few decades or so. So how would you how do you assess that question? Yeah, yeah, well, because that's that's such an important question, for, especially for a country like the US that is um, uh, you know, maybe not as firmly on the top of the pile as it was a few years ago, but it's still kind of the, the big player on the global scene. Um, and we, you know, the US, we do a lot of what we do by finding people who want to work with us and want the same kinds of things that the United States does. Um, and, and what we found again and again and again, I mean, you mentioned Afghanistan, what we found again and again is that if you are trying to work with a country in another part of the world where the people actually don't want the same things that you want, um, they're not going to throw their lives away fighting for causes they don't believe in. You know, Napoleon famously said that the moral is to the physical as three is to one in warfare. And I think this is what we're seeing. You know, the Ukrainians um, are committed to this fight. They're fighting for something they believe in. And this also speaks to your broader framework of power balances shifting throughout the world. It's been interesting to see a lot of folks who are concerned about the war continuing, who want a quick capitulation because they're afraid of escalation, fail to reckon with the fact that Ukrainians have agency in a way that I don't think would have been accurate, let's say in the 1950s or 1960s. It doesn't seem like there's anything that President Biden could do to say, all right, Zelensky, Putin is given these terms, accept these terms. So can you just speak to this idea of how during global power shifts, it is actually true that even smaller nations have greater capacities to pursue their own interests in a way that wouldn't be typical and under the previous international system? Yeah, I think um, you know, with the, the fall of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War, um, there's a, a window opens for the Ukrainians to pursue very, very different policies from the, the kinds of ones that worked, um, I was going to say worked best, worked, worked least badly for them under the Soviet Union. And um, with uh, initially, of course, with Russia being so much less powerful uh, in the 1990s than it had been for a while, there are all kinds of opportunities for the Ukrainians to, to chart their own course. And as Russia has become more assertive again, and we've had a Russian leadership more committed to to recreating something like the Soviet Union. Um, I think the Ukrainians' room for maneuver has been kind of progressively narrowed, um, but you know, not, not, not wiped out altogether. And uh, I think it's, I think historians of the future looking back on this, um, I think what they might see is Ukrainians just very, very skillfully exploiting the opportunities that were presented to them um, and recognizing you know, when they could pull away from the Russians, when they had to kind of make nice with the Russians. Because I think the, the future perspective on this, how that looks, is all going to depend on the events of the next few weeks. 
Yeah. So let's get to the piece you wrote for time. And it really is framed around this idea of roughly 1945 to much of the present has been characterized by this idea of the long piece. Can you explain what the long piece is and why it matters on a global, even long-term historical context? Yeah, well, I think you know, if you um, listen to the news a lot, um, you get this impression that we are just like living through hell. The world is falling to bits. Everybody's killing each other all the time. It's very easy to get a really distorted perspective on um, the kind of state of security in the world that we live in. Compared to really any period that we can document in the whole of human history, we've been living through this golden age of peace in the last 75 years, since, since the end of World War II. But even before that, um, you're going back for several centuries when we've got reasonable statistics for large parts of Europe and for some parts of the rest of the world as well. We can see this progressive decline in rates of violent death. And um, there's a lot of argument over this, but probably uh, people alive today, in spite of all the civil wars that are going on, in spite of the terrible things in Ukraine, you're only one-tenth as likely to die violently today as you would have been if you'd lived back in the Stone Age. And this is an extraordinary thing um, that's been happening to the world. And uh, there's arguments over the factual side of it. You know, are we getting the numbers right on this? Um, but generally speaking, the big arguments nowadays tend to be over, well, why has this happened? Why has the world moved in this direction? And um, many schools of thought, I mean, the, the one that I tend to favor is just that um, there's been this kind of recalibration of costs and benefits that, um, you know, if, if you and I get into an argument during this uh, interview, uh, I could always jump on a plane and fly over there and smash your head in with a big rock. Or actually more likely you could do that that to me, even quite a few years, maybe. Um, smash my head in with a big rock. But the chances are you're highly unlikely to decide that that is a rational way for you to pursue your interests in the world because you'll go to jail and it's going to end really, really badly for you. And I think what's happened over time is that the penalties to using violence, both at the sort of interpersonal level, just, you know, the conversation you're having down in the bar or something, um, all the way up to the interstate level, the penalties to using violence have gone up and up and up, and the benefits from using violence have gone down and down. And so, again, you know, um, the chances of us getting into a physical fight over something are very low. The chances of one of us killing each other are much, much lower. And the same kind of thing applies on the global scale as well. And part of this, I think, has been driven by the rise of individual nations like the British in the 19th century, the US in the 20th century, that have got the power to just make life hell for people who disagree with them. They can push people around. It raises the costs of um, going to war uh, to the point where you've got to be like a crazy as Saddam Hussein to think it's going to work out if you actually go to conventional head-to-head -head war with the United States. But then I think what really accelerated it was the introduction of nuclear weapons in 1945, and that now that nuclear weapons have got to be a part of your thinking if you're a, a political figure, whatever kind of conflict you're getting into. Um, is it is the price of me using violence to get what I want going to be so astronomically high that it just becomes stupid? And I think far more often than they did in the 20th or even the 19th century, leaders now will tend to say, we just can't risk open warfare. We've got to find some other way to try to get what we want. And this is what's so interesting because it ties together. Actually, a quick pause. I want to ask one more setup question. In the piece, you also just referenced the fact that this period of peace, at least especially great power peace, right? Zoom in on that part. So this isn't Iraq versus the United States. This is the lack of a war between Great Britain and France. Not, they're not technically great powers. It's semi-complicated, but for purposes of histor history, the fact that they have not gone to war is, is truly remarkable, um, especially from an 800-year history perspective. So that said, so much of your work focuses on this idea that we're seeing a shift in, in wealth and power away from the West and towards the East. And even within the West, that power is increasingly diffuse. So why is it surprising then that this sort of moment hasn't produced more violence? Yeah, um, well, I think what the reason it's surprising um, that we've seen so little great power um, actual warfare in the last 75 years is that there's been a lot of periods in world history where power and wealth have shifted from one place to another. Every single one of them has involved massive violence. Um, sometimes because the, the, the power who is, the people who are seeing power and wealth shift toward them will use force to try to speed it up. Um, sometimes because the people who are seeing power and wealth shifting away from them will use force to try to prevent it from happening. 
Every single case, so far as I'm aware, every single case has involved massive violence. And so it's slightly surprising that we haven't seen worse things happening already. And of course, it, uh, looking at it from that perspective does make you worry very much. You know, uh -oh, is it kind of baked in, um, uh, you know, sort of boiled in that we are going to see great power conflict in, in the coming decades? I think that's the great question. You know, how much does this historical pattern determine what's going to happen next? And how much is it possible to change um, the, the dead hand of the past? It seems the pessimistic answer is that the war in Ukraine is evidence that that period is basically coming to end. Would you agree or disagree with that? Uh, I would give you a resounding, I don't know, <laughs> in answer to that. Honesty. <laughs> One of the things that really strikes you when you're a historian interested in these long-term patterns is how clear things look to us now, looking back at them, and how completely unclear they were to everybody at the time living through them. And stuff that now just seems like glaringly obvious. How, how could we not have known that the Soviet Union was going to collapse? I mean, it was such a basket case. How could we not have known that? Well, we didn't. I mean, you, you have the excuse, you hadn't been born yet. But... Um, <laughs> All of us who lived through this stuff, we didn't see it. And uh, you know, I teach at a university where we had, had back in the day had many, many Kremlinologists, lots of Soviet experts. Pretty much none of them saw this coming. And it, everything as you're living through, there's multiple possible outcomes, ways and directions this could go. And like, I actually, I spent the year 1989 to 1990, kind of in the belly of the beast in Washington D.C., like a, a few minutes away from the White House, where all these great decisions are, are going on. None of us had a clue when the Berlin Wall came down what this meant and there were many many highly informed people at the very center of power who were absolutely convinced there's some Gorbachev is pulling some kind of trick here he's getting the west to lower its guard he's talking about all these deals and withdrawing Soviet troops ah he's just he's pulling one over on us again he's as bad as Brezhnev and all these other guys N nobody really had a clue what was going on and I think this has always been the case and is always likely to be the case so that's perfect. We've set up the geopolitical, geoeconomic situation that Russia is formulating its strategy within. So here's the first question. Is Putin trying to reconstitute the Soviet Union or is he trying to rebuild the Russian empire? I think the distinction was one that wouldn't have mattered up until recently, but I think it's, a, I think it's actually an important question. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think there's a lot of disagreement, I think, as I'm, I'm sure you know, a lot of disagreement over whether that actually is a question or not. So, um, there's, a, uh, there's a great British uh, TV show um, called Yes Minister, and then, uh, they had a spin-off called Yes Prime Minister, which is this comedy about this completely incompetent politician who rises to the very top of things. And uh, the, the main character in it is, is this uh, very senior civil servant, Sir Humphrey Appleby. And uh, it was uh, written, and uh, the Yes Prime Minister stuff aired, shortly after the fall of the Soviet Union and Russia is reborn as a nation. And Sir Humphrey Appleby has this thing throughout it. He refuses ever to speak of the Russians. He carries on speaking of the Soviets all the way through the 1990s. And of course, this is a big joke and everybody's laughing at the time. But um, since Putin became the top guy in Russia, I mean, a lot of people started to feel that Sir Humphrey Appleby was actually the one who had it right here. That the Soviet Union was perhaps not that different from um, the Russian Empire before it and that the coming back of an independent Russia, separate Russia, it's not that super different from the Soviets because what really matters here is the geopolitics rather than the ideologies. And this, I think this is a running debate. This is likely to, to carry on. And certainly again, for those of us who lived through the Cold War, we all remember the extent to which the discussion was pitched all around um, what communist ideology meant. And I think you look at something like say, like the famous long telegram that George Kennan I wrote just after the Second World War, um, trying to open American leaders' eyes to what was going on in Moscow, that Stalin was kind of paranoid and thought force was the solution to every problem, and that Russians saw threats and betrayal everywhere. And some people pointed out at the time that he's not actually talking about communism here. This has been a trait of Russian foreign policy going back certainly all the way to Peter the Great. And so I think this is one of the big questions. You know, to what extent um, is Putin or Stalin for that matter, are they just doing what Russian leaders have always had to do because of the, the challenges and the opportunities that geography thrusts onto them? And like say, if you think about you know, looking at the world from the Kremlin, um, one of the things that you're gonna be very aware 
and I think often in the West we kind of forget about it a little bit, is that you know, four times in the last 400 years, foreign powers have either taken Moscow or threatened to take Moscow coming from the West, coming from Europe. That is where the danger lies if you live in Moscow. It's from the West. And every Russian slash Soviet leader worth their salt has done everything in their power to push the Western frontier of Russia, Soviet Union, as far to the West as they possibly can, get it away from Moscow. We've had the Lithuanians, we've had the Poles, we've had the Swedes, we've had the French, we've had the Germans twice in the space of I was, 25 years or so taking or threatening to take Moscow, we have got to push that frontier back. And so having the, the 1991 breakup of the Soviet Union, having um, Ukraine and Belarus and all these countries suddenly become independent, this, um, I mean, not to then try to excuse what Putin is doing, but the attempt to push the frontiers back to the West, this is an entirely rational response to the geography um, that confronts Russian leaders. And I think any Russian leader who wants to be successful and remembered as a great Russian leader is going to try to push this frontier back. Um, the, the question of course is, is how you go about doing that. And you know, what we've seen Putin doing um, since, uh, since the early, so at least the early 2010s has been sort of defaulting to a kind of Soviet mode of operation, using force to try to do this. You know, it's interesting, just a quick note, your yes minister reference is funny because I was editing one, a previous episode. I've been doing these every single day, so I'm getting a little sloppy. And I noted, I kept referring to the Russians as Soviets and I had to keep editing it out. And it's also particularly insane given the fact that I was born in 1992. So I literally have no, I literally have no physical memory of, of the Soviet Union, but it goes to the point you're making. So, okay, a couple, couple questions come from this. So one, given you just argued that from a geopolitical, geostrategic, even national interest perspective, you can see a case for the Russians wanting to expand eastward to protect themselves. Is this... Is the conflict we're seeing about Putin as this unique figure in the 21st century, or is it about Russia? So to question the title of your piece, how much of this is Putin's grand strategy? How much is this Russia's grand strategy? Because what really matters here is, okay, I don't believe in the palace coup idea. I don't think it's going to happen, but let's say it did happen. Let's say Alexei Navalny, for some magical reason, is, is released from prison. He's appointed, he, you know, he's made president, he's elected democratically. To what degree would he pursue the same, not, he would not be as aggressive as Putin is. I think there is personal biography there, but how much is Russia intrinsically going to push given what you're describing here? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, that's an interesting counterfactual. What if Navalny suddenly takes over? And um, I, I mean, of course, I, I don't know what would be going through his head. I, if I were him, I'd be pretty angry about things. But um, yeah, yeah. He, he may be a very different person from me. If I were in his shoes and uh, suddenly took over in Moscow, um, I think my geostrategic goal would be pretty similar to Vladimir Putin's, which is get that frontier away to the West. But there's a lot of different ways you can go about doing this. Mm -hmm. And like, look at, say, your um, NATO's strategy after the Soviet Union came to bits, get that frontier pushed to the East, um, which is a perfectly rational thing for NATO planners to want to do. It'd be kind of weird if they didn't think that way, because Russia, Russia is Russia. It's going to, it's not a great power in 1992, but it's going to be back. And uh, this is a famous defense planning guidance was written in 1992 it caused a lot of trouble at the time saying the US's long-term strategy just has to be to make sure that there are these four regions in the world they say where a, a rival great power could generate the resources to challenge American hegemony one East Asia Western Europe um, the Middle East and then the former Soviet Union so that push those guys back, get them as far away from our European allies as possible. Uh, but how do we go about doing it? Well, we don't invade anybody. We don't send tanks rolling to Poland or anything. Um, we say to them, look how great it is on our side of the fence. Don't you want to be here too? And they come running. Because um, the United States, Western Europe have so much soft power, so attractive, so many things about democracy, standards of living. Um, there's nothing to stop the Russians trying to do something like that. I mean, it's a, it's a harder sell. Obviously, it's a much poorer country. But there's a gazillion ways you could go about trying to roll that frontier away from the Russian heartland out to the West to attract the Ukrainians and the Belarusians and the, even the Baltic states to attract them toward the Russian side. And that, obviously, that is not the way that Putin has been working. So I, I would guess at, at this very abstract level, I would say Navalny is probably not going to 
and look at the world that differently from uh, Vladimir Putin or Peter the Great, but he would go about it in a wildly different way, um, and, and a vastly better way. And it's interesting because as you're articulating, what could this alternate situation look like? This, this isn't possible in the 90s. It's not possible in the aughts. But once again, China and Russia are de facto allies. There is this broader conversation around the West falling. Europe is in complete disarray post-Brexit. Insert statement about populism over the past few years. So there is just, to your, to, to, to your point, there actually is this Eurasian narrative. And actually, in part of this is, you saw this in Hungary, but you saw Viktor Orban talk about how actually... You know, Hungary kind of is a Eurasian power. We are not merely just a European country. So you you did kind of see a bit of the inklings of this. And it seems that to take a podcaster, so not a historian's perspective, I just think there, there's a there's a world among many where a conclusion would be Putin miscalculated and when it was necessary to pull the trigger on that narrative. He, he actually miscalculated. Actually, it turns out there is a West. And actually, it turns out there, there is a yeah. Europe. And it turns out the Chinese actually are not quite as aligned with Russia. They're, they're aligned, but they're not aligned for capital A. So here's here's the second question then. So you're, you're telling the story of four centuries of horrific death and destruction um, that Russia has suffered because um, it did not secure the plains of Ukraine and just always this, this, this big corridor from Central Europe, right? Complete concession. This is all very true. At the same time, though, there are other parts of Europe, for example, where there have been horrific, terrible wars. Think of, you know, the Thirty Years' War. Fourth mm -hmm. of German, the German population dies. Think of France and Britain, Alsace Lorraine. You have war after war after war happen. Yet these countries are able to get over it. The Germans do not wake up every day and say to themselves, and you can see this in people's GDP spending when it comes to their defense budgets. The Germans do not wake up every day and say, if we don't keep it up, we think right now that Macron is cool, but what happens if this other leader comes? He could change his mind. He or she could change their minds. So what do you think differentiates between country? And, I, and it's, it feels really rude and unfair to say, get over it, because it's not, history isn't that simple, but we're on a podcast, so I'll be crass. What determines whether a country can get over it and not get over it? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, a great question. I think if, if I knew the answer to that, I would be very rich and important. Um, but <laughs> unfortunately, like everybody else, I don't really know the answer to that. And I think what makes it so complicated is, of course, that the same country can get over it sometimes and signally fail to get over it other times. So yeah. German is the classic case here. They, yeah, these guys, they did not get over 1918 in a hurry. And yet 1945, totally different story. And um, I mean, and, you know, there's a lot of theories out there about why you get these such different outcomes. And I mean, one of them, uh, which is kind of the, the nastiest of the theories, but one that I think is not, not totally without some sort of something to it, is that you know, 1918 wasn't bad enough. Um, this was the problem, that Germany uh, was on the verge of starvation, revolution broke out, things were just falling to pieces abruptly. Um, but then the war ended. Germany was not broken up into its constituent parts the way some of the French wanted to see done. Uh, they didn't starve by their millions the way some of the British did want to see happen. You know, they weren't actually invaded and occupied by Russians and, and British and American armies. It wasn't bad enough. And um, so that uh, a, a scheming man like Hitler could convince people that Germany didn't actually lose the war at all. It was betrayed from within. And if we do it properly the next time, we can rebuild, we, we can do this, we can follow more or less the same strategy uh, in World War II that we did in World War I, using violence to solve all our problems. And that was an answer that persuaded enough Germans in the 1920s and early 30s that Hitler was able to get into power. I was, after 1945, it, I think it's very hard to imagine anybody in Berlin or Tokyo being able to sell a line like that to anybody. They've been just so absolutely thoroughly devastated by what happened. And um, but I guess the, the interesting question, of course, is that, okay, so 30 years after the war, you can understand nobody in Germany or Japan wanting to have any militaristic thoughts whatsoever. And yet both those countries have stayed on this non-militaristic path. And obviously, again, both of them are uh, having to rethink that a little bit at the moment. But you know, extraordinary record of 
anti-war politics in, in both of these countries. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's, you know, it's one of the big questions. How do you change a national culture um, so spectacularly? Is it possible to change the Russian national culture away from the sort of thing that George Kennan wrote about 70 odd years ago, this sort of paranoia and suspicion of everybody else and thinking that everyone is trying to do you down all the time and you need to hit them first. Is it possible to change that sort of thing? I, I don't know. Yeah, just to add two bits there, because I want to make a point you made very explicit for listeners who are new to the history here. You're referencing this the stab in the back theory, um, which often, which is literally what Hitler and the Nazis used to argue. And part of what made the argument that the Germany was betrayed from within so effective was, once again, like you said, they were not occupied. Germans did not see French troops walking their way to Berlin. So it came to be like, if we weren't defeated, it must have been conspiracy. It must have been the Jews. It must have been it, it, at a very literal level. The, the situation itself was just incomprehensible. And it was and it was a major problem that this was never even articulated in an effective fashion. So an, another thing I'd want to want to go to then is the obvious complicated answer to this question, which is, well, what happened in Germany and Japan was the U.S. occupied and continues to spend uh to continues to leave troops in the countries, which was obviously never an option um, in 1991 on a couple of different levels. And the other thing too that was done here is if you're Japan, the the emperor um, and the specific um, like militarism intended within the Japanese empire is abolished because we rewrite their constitution. And then in the German case, we, the Allies, the, um, the Soviets, abolish Prussia. So Prussia, the most the most militaristic German state, is is literally abolished and folded into parts of Poland um, and Russia and all these different parts. So we, on a literal level, did not have, nor do I think should we have had that opportunity in 1991. So I want to get to an, another question. Can you talk about the importance of Putin? at a strategic level, arguing that Ukraine and Russia are actually effectively not only the same, not constituent parts of the same geopolitical entity, but actually are one people. Because the added point to the initial one around wars are going down, civil wars are still, in fact, increasing in some circumstances. So one could argue, hey, good news, Ian, great power war isn't going on, because actually this is a civil war, as the Chinese would argue an invasion of Taiwan would likely be. So can you speak to the importance of this civil war argument? Mm, yeah, and that's an interesting way um, to think about it. And I, I do suspect that Putin is at least somewhat being sincere when he says things like he doesn't think of Ukraine as a, a, a different country. It's part of the same Russia. And, and a lot of Russians have, have felt that way. Um, but uh, again, I guess this sort of comes back to this issue about national identities and national cultures, um, the extent to which uh, Ukraine was so Russianized during the Russian occupation, uh, the Soviet occupation, that it did sort of become part of Russia. And most of the Ukrainians that I know personally very much don't feel that way. But of course, I, I may be dealing with a rather self-selecting set uh, of people who've chosen to emigrate um, from there. But uh, I mean, this this business about you know, being able to convert one group of people who consider themselves to be ethnically or religiously distinct uh, from you, convert them into part of you. It is something, it, it really does happen. And this is something we see over and over again in history, but it tends to take a, a very long time. I say, I mean, something like the Roman Empire, when the Romans are expanding uh, around the Mediterranean basin, they're encountering people who have very distinct uh, ideas of their own identity. But over the course of like three, 400 years, people increasingly come to see themselves as Romans. And um, I strongly suspect this is how Vladimir Putin sees the relationship between Russia and Ukraine, that these people really have become Russians now. And that, uh, yeah, in a sense, it, it kind of is a civil war. And it's interesting because if you look at, once again, if you look at Russia, Russia has plenty of um, people groups within it that are far more separate ethnically from Ukrainians and Russians. So once again, the idea, and, and this is this is just the broader, this seems to be a, a successful reality that Western democratic countries have right now is that they're, and, and it's complicated in, in Europe, especially continental Europe, but once again, British identity is, is expansive. Um, American identity is expansive. The debate that Putin seems to fall into is that to what degree is Russian identity expansive? And does that expansion require 
um, military means. So, so the next the next question then would be, you really make clear that there, there are there are effectively a couple of dates that we should really think about. So, and 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 figures. Um, so from two thousand five on, you have Putin increasingly speaking uh, of, of this, of the tragedy of the collapse of the Soviet Union, speaking against NATO, speaking of Russian interests, you say that he develops, he and, and Jaros, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to even bother with the pronunciation, that the, the chief of staff of, uh, I couldn't read my handwriting there, the chief of staff of, of, of Russia's actual military, they, they, they create a strategy designed to expand, to accommodate this geostrategic situation. So could you explain that and give the relevant dates and context? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, one of the patterns we see over and over again in the history of the war and interstate politics is that um, you get periods when a lot of actors, a lot of countries think they can get what they want by using force. And you get a lot of wars as they'll try to use force to achieve their aims. Um, and then you get periods when you've got one great power or else maybe some kind of coalition of great powers that makes going to war just seem highly unlikely to to deliver the results for other players. And so the other players, one way you could react to there being a big bully on the block, like the British Empire in the 19th century or the United States in large parts of the 20th century, you can react to this by like bandwagoning with them, jumping on their bandwagon saying, you whatever you want to do, guys, just tell us what you want us to do. We'll do that. And then please be nice to us. And uh, that's one way to deal with it. The other way to deal with it though is to figure out some way to engage in competition and conflict with the great power without it ever actually turning into a war which you're confident you're going to lose. And um, there's like an, I, I suspect an infinite number of different ways of doing this that people have figured out. Uh, like insurgencies are one way to do this. Mm -hmm. Like say, um, you know, the US occupies Afghanistan, all these Afghans decide they don't much like this, start shooting at American soldiers. Hey, we could just nuke the entire country, kill everybody in it. But they know they're not going to do that. So you, you, um, you develop a way of using force and violence to get what you want that stays below the level at which your great power opponent is going to resort to uh, ways of behaving that you just can't compete with. So um, as long as you don't get too aggressive, too hostile, it provokes the great power too much, you can maybe get away with using force to wear them down until, uh, as just happened, they, they withdraw from your country and leave it to you. And um, that's not something that would work for Vladimir Putin. I mean, he can't wage an insurgency against the United States because it's just not that situation. So um, Putin, or, or actually, I mean, that makes it sound like he's uh, makes it sound like he's this Wizard of Oz figure, sort of manipulating everything behind the scenes. It's actually the guys in the Russian military thinking about what can I do to advance my career, be a successful guy in the Russian military. But well, one thing I can do is come up with some way that we can, uh, the army can help us help the leadership get what it wants. And so this guy, um, Valery uh, Gerasimov, he came up with this. Well, actually, a, a bunch of guys were talking about the same sorts of things, but Gerasimov is the one whose name it sort of got attached to. He said, well, what you want to do is, um, okay, you don't want to provoke the great power into uh, some direct confrontation with us, but we do want to shove them out of places we don't like being, like Ukraine. So you want to do things where it's never quite clear what is actually going on here. Everything should be about these sort of grey, shadowy movements shrouded in this mist of obscurity and double meanings, and just everything is ambiguous. So, like, we want to get Crimea back, which, again, you know, if you're a Russian leader going all the way back to Peter the Great, of course you want to get Get Crimea back. It would like, you know, would the US want to get Florida back if the Cubans invaded Florida? Yes, of course we would. We, we have to. And so these guys think, well, we've got to get Crimea back. We can't invade Ukraine and occupy Crimea, at least not at that point, um, mm -hmm. because the roof will fall in on us. So what we do is we start all these stories about how all these ethnic Russians in Crimea are agitating to come back to Russia. They all want to come back to Russia. And now there's all these guys running around with guns shooting everybody, but they're not Russian soldiers, even if they're in the Russian army. They're just guys who happen to be in the Russian army who are now running around shooting people in Crimea and the Donbass region. And everything, you keep it as just as murky and difficult to work out what's going on as possible. Um, 
destabilizing things, you cyber attacks uh, on the banking system, the healthcare system, you know, discredit the Ukrainian government, so float as many stories about corruption as you possibly can, although well, goodness knows there's plenty of real corruption in Ukraine as well, but just you make the government look illegitimate, make it look like it's not a real country, one of, one of Putin's lines, um, and that all this violence is going on, it's not Russia's fault, it's Ukraine's own fault because their government is illegitimate and the people won't stand for it. And then Gerasimov's line, he says, uh, you make humanitarian crises, you make political and cultural crises. And then at a certain point, and this is uh, literally what he says, he doesn't define anything, at a certain point, um, there will be a military action that just sort of underlines what has already actually come to pass. And I think yeah, this is certainly what we saw in 2014. And um, when the when, when the Russians started massing troops around the Ukrainian borders, uh, end of last year, the beginning of this year, I, like a lot of people, I thought this was just another version of the Gerasimov Doctrine playing out again, and that they were probably going to occupy the, the two breakaway provinces and say that these provinces have basically been annexed to Russia now, these people want to be Russian. And like, again, like, like most of the people who are supposed to be knowing more about this, um, I was really surprised when it turned into this all-out invasion, which I think was a massive miscalculation by Putin, who generally seems to have just been really, really skilled judging things like Syria and Ukraine in the past. I think huge miscalculation because I think they seriously thought the Ukrainian army was going to fold, that there was no national will there at all, and um, they could quickly overrun the whole country, install a puppet government, then probably keep those two provinces uh, and have a land bridge to Crimea, but otherwise get out of the country by this point of uh, the struggle. Um, so, so yeah, it's a it's a, a way of the Gerasimov doctrine, a way of dealing with um, a, a dominant superpower without ever letting things escalate to the level where you've got to face a real possibility of a military backlash. And of course, a lot of people suggest that China is doing exactly the same thing in the South China Sea and, and in Taiwan as well. And the key thing to bring in the next stage of the strategy, which is now that the specific strategy did not work, you did not take Kiev in three or four days, they've transitioned in your words to their escalate to de-escalate strategy can you explain it, it's counterintuitive to a to a, i'd say the western context but what is this strategy and, and how are we seeing it play out over these past few weeks Yes, it, it is. Uh, I think you're absolutely right to call it a counterintuitive strategy, uh, and which is one reason why a lot of people think it can't possibly work. But this is an idea that another group of senior Russian officers floated, I think, initially in an article they published in 1999, where they said, well, OK, um, there's all these nuclear weapons out there. Even though the numbers come down by like 80 percent since the 1980s. But there's still a lot of nuclear weapons out there. And the thinking with nuclear weapons has generally been, since at least the 1960s, that nuclear weapons are there as deterrents. They're not there as things anybody actually uses. Um, and the whole force is their deterrent force. So some of these Russian officers start saying, well, what if we kind of don't get on board with that? Um, we know that nuclear war is, all out nuclear war is the ultimate nightmare for everyone. And so everyone is determined to avoid all out nuclear war at all costs. So what if we found ourselves in a war uh, that seems to be escalating? And if it's you know, if we're confronting the United States, escalation is bad for us because the US can escalate so much higher than we can. So what if we dramatically escalate what's happening ourselves by using nuclear weapons, sending a signal by doing that, that we are ready to do this, ready to use nuclear weapons. If you persist in the course of action you're following, this is going to turn into a nuclear war. So don't persist in that course of action, de-escalate instead. You know, maybe you are um, sending special forces to Ukraine or enforcing a no-fly zone or some of the other things people have talked about. Well, stop it because we are looking, we Russians are looking at that as a step on the path to nuclear war. So we're gonna be one step ahead of you. And if you wanna stop this, you've got to de-escalate, bring it back down to a level of violence that we are more comfortable with. So, I mean, it's sort of, a, it's, a, it's a clever idea and stuff, but uh, a lot of people, I think perhaps rightly think that it's like, it's too clever. You, uh, th th this is not a game of chess we're playing here. You start dropping nuclear bombs on people, um, just all hell is going to break loose. You know, it's interesting. You reference Clausewitz in Clausewitz in, in the piece. So he's a um, German military stra strategic intellectual from the 19th century, I believe. He comes to fame by writing about Napoleon's wars. The interesting point that you make, though, is that war is just politics by other means. So one of the explanations for the decline in 
in war is just that there are alternate methods for accomplishing your political goals. So you don't need to invade Poland to make it Western. You invite it to join a political union and a military defense alliance, EU and NATO. So that's an example of that. The problem, it seems to me, with the escalate to de-escalate is at least the Gerasimov doctrine accomplishes your political goal, which is we want to move the Russian border. We want to orient Russia, um, Ukraine towards us. So it's much more like our relationship with Belarus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Whether or not that strategy works, which it obviously didn't, at least in its best case scenario, it accomplishes the political goal. But if escalate to de-escalate, that doesn't accomplish the political goal in any way whatsoever. Sure, you could use a tactical nuke on a NATO deployment or a base where foreign troops are troops are meeting, but that would only increase the hostility that other countries would face to you. Sure, you're not going to get an invasion of Moscow, but if you think the sanctions are bad now, imagine the sanctions in that situation. So I just love you to talk about the Klauswitzian implications here, because frankly, your point there is why I'm optimistic long term about Ukraine, because it seems to me that because they did not win in the first three to four days, their actual political goals are impossible. So I'm just curious how you think about that dynamic. Yeah, yeah, I think um, Clausewitz would have had a hissy fit if he'd heard about escalating to de-escalate, because uh, one of the big things he, uh, one of his big points in, in his uh, big book on war is that um, he was writing, uh, like you're saying, in the Napoleonic era, just after the Napoleonic era, where Europe, after a century when there'd been a lot of wars, but they'd all been very limited wars for, for very discrete political goals, and Napoleon lurches everything over into total war. You mobilize the entire people, you put millions of men under arms, and you just torch the entire continent if you need to. And Clausewitz has come out of this experience. And so he says, you know, big thing he's learned, once you start down this path, war begets more war. Um, and there's no way to turn it on and off. You know, once you start up the machinery of total war, it'll go until it reaches its logical conclusion, which with nuclear weapons is, of course, something we don't even want to contemplate. And so, yeah, Clausewitz would have said, absolutely, this is just insane what some of these Russians have been talking about. Um, but desperate people do desperate things. And um, when you if you convince yourself that um, getting Ukraine back into the Russian orbit is an existential issue for Russia, that Russia will not be able to survive without doing that, then all kinds of risks to anybody else would just seem absolutely lunatic, begin to seem worth thinking about. I think that's the, the great danger, that it's very easy to get sort of really cerebral about thinking about nuclear war. I mean, I get the 1950s, the Rand Corporation designs all these uh, you know, game theoretic analyses of nuclear war, working out the Nash equilibria, so everybody maximizes their God without destroying the world. And the Soviets look at this and just laugh. They say, you know, if there's a war, we're just going to blow you all up. We're not going to be worrying about mathematical equilibria here. Um, I think that things, uh, if the Russians do decide to use a nuclear weapon, then I think um, we are, this is just going to go really, really bad, really, really quickly. I think you're absolutely right that, that the political goals they set out with have failed completely in the first week of the fighting. So now I think in, in some ways the big question is, yeah, well, what happens next? I, I think it's perfectly credible that the Russians will eventually grind the Ukrainians down. I mean, you think back to the, the Soviet war against the Finns in 1939, where the Soviet army did even worse than the Russian army's been doing the last couple of weeks. But eventually, though this goes on for months and months, eventually they wear the Finns down just by weighted numbers. And that could well happen in Ukraine. Um, but where does that leave Putin and the Russians? If they've got what should the military victory that should have delivered the political victory but isn't going to deliver the political victory if the whole of ukraine now becomes afghanistan insurgency everywhere what happens then yeah and the key thing is that with every single day this goes on ukrainian identity only becomes stronger and stronger and stronger which is which is once again the I think I, I, this won't be the title of the episode but it seems my takeaway from what you're describing is that it really seems like russian strategy if was if, if we should take it as literally as it's been broadcast, got too cute by half um, a, a couple of different times. Um, so for these last 15, I really want to talk about um, two books of yours because they get at 
interesting questions. So one book, Why the West Rules for Now, The Patterns of History and What They Reveal About the Future has been out for a while. Um, but you have an upcoming book called Geography is Destiny, Britain's Place in the World, a 10,000 year history. Um, talking to your publisher, would love to have you back in June when the book comes out to actually talk about that. But just to give a big preview, it seems these two books are really interested in Western identity. Um, and in the case of Britain, specifically European identity. And so much of this conflict really hinged on Putin explicitly believing that the West as a concept has really weakened in terms of its, not only its legitimacy, but also its willingness to stand up for things, uh, questions about the European Union strength post-Brexit. And then there's also this broader question of what even is the West? Um, Stephen Kotkin had an interesting interview um, in The New Yorker where he said, well, the West is basically a series of institutions. So Japan is Western. You know, that's a, I, I think there's something to that, but I don't think it's quite accurate, but there's, there's something to it. So you just for as long as you want to go, just really talk to us about the West and Europe and what and what these identity groups mean. But also at the same time, Britain is also a part of this coalition. So what is Europe? What is NATO? Just all of this fitting together, I think is fascinating. Yeah, well, this is one of the sort of the, the biggest and oldest debates among historians, Western historians, that is, is you know, what is the West? And uh, if you look at uh, these debates, there's a historian named Norman Davies, who is actually a Polish, Poland was his main focus, but he wrote a lot about Europe generally. And in one of his books, he just run, does a quick tabulation of all the different ways he can identify that historians have defined this expression, the West. And there's like hundreds of them. And um, which is suggested to him, um, at least, that this is kind of a meaningless, it's a, uh, well, in a certain sense, meaningless. In another way, it's kind of a tactical concept that we deploy in order to advance ideas that we've got. So some people will say, well, the West, the West is basically Christianity, Christian civilization. Uh, but then people will say, well, what about the Eastern Orthodox Church? Is Byzantium part of the West? Is Russia part of the West? And so, yeah, maybe that's not what we want to do. Others will say, well, democracy, democracy is what the West is all about. And so then, you know, obviously, Japan, all kind of India, lots of places that democratic wouldn't exactly normally think of as Western. And you can go on and on like this with almost any definition um, that you, you, any idea that you care to try to organize the concept around, you can, you can do that. But all of them have all these problems. So um, when I got interested in this, which is like in the late 1990s, um, I got interested in it because I come out of a background in classics and the study of ancient Greece and Rome. And the, I, over the last 200, 250 years, the study of ancient Greece and Rome has been a really big deal in Europe and European overseas colonies. You know, lots of money and, and university positions goes into it. And the justification for this is this idea that started up really in the 18th century um, is that... Uh, the distinctive thing about what we nowadays typically call the West is that it's societies that have descended culturally and institutionally, intellectually from the ancient Greeks. So the ancient Greeks, two and a half thousand years ago, had this unique kind of society is creative and youthful and energetic and scientific. It changes the world and Western countries are those that inherit the ancient Greek legacy. And this, um, this had become an unpopular idea in the late 20th century because it's a smack of Eurocentrism and implicit racism and all kinds of other things. It kind of retreated into the background a bit, but it hadn't entirely gone away. But then what has really thrown it into sort of disarray was this idea that, well, um, if the, the West is has sort of risen to be the dominant part of the world because it inherited this ancient Greek ideal, um, then why is it that now in the, the 1990s, the Japanese and the Chinese economies seem to be on, on path to overtake uh, the largest Western economies? What's going on here? If it's you know, the West is best because it's inherited the ancient Greek ideal, well, China and Japan haven't inherited it. So what is going on here? And so a lot of academics are arguing about this. And this got me kind of thinking, because like my specialty has tended to be long-term uh, approach to history, saying, well, are there patterns that you can identify that go back thousands of years? And if there, if there are patterns, what are the patterns? What direction do the patterns seem to be headed in? And where might they go next? And so I started thinking, well, can we, approach this question from that sort of perspective. And so I started from just a very geographical um, way of thinking about the West, because it is a geographical term. It's not a cultural term, it's a geographical term. It's a point direction on the compass. So um, to saying, well, at what point in the past do we see a, a distinctive kind of way of things, or, or way of organizing civilizations developing that you can 
define as being Western. And uh, it seemed to me that the end of the Ice Age, going back 12,000 years, the end of the Ice Age, um, the Western end of Eurasia, um, so the East Mediterranean, what we now call the Middle East, that starts to develop, it's the first part of the world to develop agriculture and farming and then cities and governments and empires, all these things develop there first. That is the route where you need to be looking to think about a, a Western tradition that we need to explain. So I got this got me very, very interested, basically in the sort of question we've been talking about today of how does geography relate to everything else, including culture and identity? What is the relationship between these things? And which leads you, I think, almost inevitably to this question, well, what is the relationship between the kind of brute forces of geography and free will and human agency? To what extent are we prisoners of geography? To what extent do we make our own fates? And I think this is just this fascinating problem. And it's one that I think historians have sort of let go of that problem as we got more and more specialized. It's a problem that really hits you in the face when you talk about the global scale. But if you're talking about you know, three years in one small town in southwestern Germany, you kind of don't have to worry too much about free will and human agency. You can just sort of you know, get on with your job. And so at, once I started down this path toward the long term global histories, this became the um, defining question for me. What is the relationship between the brute material, vast impersonal forces and the, the very important people and the sort of individual in history? And it's interesting, in defense of historians who are overly specialized in your telling, it's also the fact that up until really Brexit, election of Trump, you did just have this globalization story which suggested there was a flattening, not just suggested, there, there, there was, it, it yeah. seems, a, a, a clear flattening of, of culture. You know, this is the whole jihad versus big world reference in the 1990s. This is this idea of up and, and it was never actually technically true because of uh, the Bosnia and Kosovo war, but this idea of two countries that have McDonald's, like don't go to war, um, Ukraine and Russia, well, Russia not anymore, um, had McDonald's when they went. Um, so th 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 there was just this idea of flattening. So can you, let's just close with this question then. What, and it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big, it's a, it's a big question, but what would you suggest is the proper way to conceive of the different camps as we're looking at this century, right? So during the Cold War, the idea of communism versus capitalism, while complicated, especially after Russia gives up exporting um, communism as a very explicit part of its foreign policy, same thing goes for Maoism. That goes, but it's still it's still a category that explains. Okay, here is why the Philippines and South Korea and Japan and Great Britain and the United States. Here's why they are all a part of a camp. And then there's the Second World, India you know, uh, Indonesia, Jakarta, th these are all part of the second world because they are not choosing to be a part of that competition. Here, it's not quite West versus East because like we said, Japan, South Korea, and then it's not quite Eurasia versus the West. So I, I kind of, a world that's a word that seems cliched, but accurate is just like this. And it's not the ideal world, but the only world I have to think of it is basically the, is the free world. Um, so a very, a very, a very Cold War 1980s term that at least pushes aside the geography question and centralizes things around autocracy versus democracy. But just to close, like what, what, what? You don't have to give the perfect answer because it's an evolving space. But how do you, how do you? Yeah, I'll make sure to preface that. How do you just think about this question of of camps and geography and ideology? Yeah, I think if you look at the really long term. I'm going all the way back to the Ice Age again. There is your one big story in history. It just dominates every other story, which is precisely this coming together of the world. Globalization has been the story for the last 14,000 years. And it's accelerated really rapidly, of course, in the last 150 years. But that has always been the big story. Uh, when you're living at the human scale, that is not always what you see. There are periods when it kind of goes backwards, like say, uh, obviously after the First World War, one of the classic uh, periods when it all seems to go backwards. Um, just the last five, 10 years, again, another period where it all seems to be going backwards. But seen from the 14,000 year scale, those become minor blips. And so uh, I think you're looking at this very, very long-term story. The question about what's happening now becomes, I think, 
is this another blip? I mean, is this going to be like the, you know, we're living through the 1930s again, basically and something terrible is going to happen like it did in the 1940s. And then the story gets back on track. Is that what's happening now? Or um, when you look at the, the, the long run, can you see other periods when it's not a minor blip when the story's going backwards, but it's a, a cycle that lasts for several centuries. I say the fall of the Roman Empire. It's a classic one that it takes basically about a thousand years to get the kind of level of cultural economic integration back in Europe that you had before the fall of the Roman Empire. So that's a really long, it's still a blip, but it's a really, really long term blip. Is that what we're entering now? And we're going to see maybe you know, a century or more of the fracturing and breaking up and spinning apart of the world. And uh, very hard to say. I think this again is one that historians in the future will know the answer. I think there's really no way that we can know the answer. Um, but in, in terms of what you're saying about the um, rival camps competing over the world, the free world, more autocratic version, this I think this is a, another story that goes back a long way. And um, one way that I think is useful to think about what happened in the 20th century is that 20th century. Um, we're seeing the playing out of a story that begins in the 19th century, where the world is revolutionized by the discovery of fossil fuel power. We've lived for millennia in an agrarian world where basically everything is done by organic sources of power. You want to move a big box of rocks, a big pile of rocks, you pick it up and carry it. Your muscles move that, those rocks. The most sophisticated things you've got uh, to move the rocks for you are other animals with bigger muscles. Everything is ultimately driven by muscle power or by machines we rig up to tame wind power, solar power, stream, water power. Um, but these sorts of forces, this is the only thing that drives the things along in the world. Then crack the secret of fossil fuels, we've got steam engines, revolutionizes the capture of energy, just explodes the possibilities for the world. And in the 19th, but in particularly in the 20th century, I think you get this struggle that goes on over what is the best way to organize a high energy industrialized society? Is it by just throwing it totally open and saying, hey, you know, the decisions are really being made by the individuals on the factory floor, um, individuals buying and selling things, just put it in their hands, devolve power as far down the social structure as you possibly can. You have a stock market, you have free market enterprise, free speech, free everything, free up everything, do away with every internal barrier, um, believing that women can't work outside the home, well, that cuts the labor market in half. So let's stop believing that. Let's get women into the labor force, double the size of the labor market. Um, you know, just break down all the barriers, um, let a thousand flowers bloom. This is one big theory of how you do it in a fossil fuel economy. But of course, there's another big theory, which is, oh, no, no, you have a five-year plan. You build a bunch of gulags and you ship the nasty people out there. You define your enemies um, and you, you sort of homogenize your society. You say there's one in Germany, you say that one racial group that this society should be in Soviet Union, one class group. Whereas in the Western countries, they homogenize their countries by saying, hey, there's all these different races and classes and sexual orientations, but that just doesn't matter. It's just the fact that we're all here, we're all Americans, that's the only thing that matters. So it's like two different ways of thinking about designing a kind of homogeneous society that's able to operate um, a new industrial factory-based regime. And the 20th century thing in particular becomes this head-to-head -head conflict between these two visions of the world. And it turns out that the the Western, if you want to call it that, but this is a liberal, democratic, freedom-based way of organizing a fossil fuel economy just works so much better than um, the, the top-down centralized one. And uh, because the, the Western powers have to rely on the top-down Soviet Union to defeat Hitler, but then the Western powers succeed in the end in defeating the Soviet Union too. And in the 1990s, because we get all this talk about the end of history, which now, now looks so kind of comical, but at the time it didn't, because um, it sort of made sense it felt like it made sense of what had just happened. This liberal democratic system had proved itself decisively superior to the top-down autocratic one. But then you get into the 21st century and you know, all of a sudden things don't look so clear anymore. And uh, um, I, well, I think you've got to be very silly to deny uh, that there are ways in which China has really run rings around the Western democracies in the last few years. And not in every way, but there, there are ways in which they've done that. Um, so again, it's this, the same sort of questions we were talking about earlier. Is this some blip? I mean, is this like the 1930s again and uh, in the next generation, the Western democracies will once again reveal their superiority of the way they do things? 
things over the centralized one? Or is this the beginning of a longer phase when, in fact, you know, the world is changing faster than ever before, obviously. Um, and is it changing in ways such that a more centralized, less free way of doing things is able to compete better on the international scene than the democratic way of doing things, which is what a lot of people seem to think that is the case. And uh, again, as a historian, you study a bunch of these different sorts of episodes. I think the big thing you learn is that the people living through it, um, it's never clear to them what the answers are. Some of the voices we hear out there have got the right answer, but we don't know which ones it is, and we don't know how to tell which ones it is. And again, only history will tell you that. This is an excellent place to leave it. Um, Ian, we'd love for you to shout out any of your recent books, but especially Geography is Destiny um, for the listeners. Oh, I'm sorry, pardon? Uh, I'd love for you just to shout out um, Geography is oh, Destiny. Yeah. The, 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 the uh, author call out moves books as opposed to me. Um, <laughs> because uh, let's be honest, folks, this is, a, this is a large book. I have not finished it yet. Um, just got it from the publisher. So you could do a better pitch than I can. <laughs> Uh, sure, yeah. Well, so um, uh, I've written quite a few books over the last 10 years or so, but the, the one that's coming out this spring is called Geography is Destiny, Britain and the World, a 10,000 year history. And um, I decided to write it the day after the Brexit referendum. Like, like a lot of people, I was really surprised by that result. Um, but uh, when I started looking into uh, the long term history of Britain's geographical relations with the rest of the world, I realized that what happened in 2016 in Britain uh, was just the latest round of a really, really old debate. And in fact, um, from what we read in Authors Under the Roman Empire, you could have described Brexit to a guy like Tacitus, the Roman historian, and he would have understood exactly what you were talking about. The same principles, the same geographical principles were already at work, because people were kind of playing them out in different ways. And what I also realized writing this book is that it's a book, the book is about Britain, but it's not just about Britain. Um, exactly the same questions about what are the issues that geography forces us to confront. These same questions are coming up all over the Western world at the moment. And um, the sort of answers that the British electorate opted for in the Brexit vote, they are the sort of answers that a lot of people in the United States and other countries also feel this is the sort of direction we need to be going in to deal with the world as it really is, as, it, as it's now becoming. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so it's a book basically about the state of the world right now. See, I could not have delivered one fifteenth of that. Um, excellent, Ian. Looking forward to having you back on the show. Thank you for joining us on The Realignment. Well, thanks so much for having me. This has been great.